So here today, I talk about the Endangered Species Act. And Tom, correctly, I want to preface the uh, remarks by saying that uh, uh, you know, Tom correctly identified the fact that, uh, did that work? Yeah, well, screw it. You'll put up with me as long as I'm talking. <laughs> that I am not a member of the government. I don't, I'm, a, I'm an overseer. I'm a watchdog. I, I, my job is to, if you like, be critical when things aren't going well. And so uh, I'll preface that in my remarks because my remarks might be a bit critical today. But we want to start, let, let's start be, at the beginning with endangered species. What does it mean? And, and really the beginning goes back to an obscure bird that was discovered on a small island, a small island in a distant ocean in 1598. And then, in, subsequently, it was utilized for food and what have you, and uh, the last recorded living species uh, specimen, I should say, was in 1693, not quite uh, a century later. And everybody's actually heard of the name of this, this bird, it's not that small, large bird, um, because it, it, it embedded itself in the culture of the Western, the Western culture of, of all the nations, European nations and now the American and Canadian nations. Because it is the, and it was, the first identified example of a human-based extinction. Before that occurred, people didn't realize that humans could. In fact, the, the Christian religion of the time uh, suggested that humans weren't possible of driving species to extinction. So when that occurred, when the Western culture became aware that uh, we had those godlike powers to drive things to extinction, it had a profound effect. And so we have this obscure species that has lingered as an echo of the, of the realization of the power of human activity. So why are we concerned about endangered species? Well, that's the, the first question. Well, you could, the easy answer is like we're, we, we have a law in Ontario. We've had a law that, that um, has been before the legislature of Ontario twice. And so we can say it's the will of Ontario to be concerned about endangered species. We can extend that. We could say, well, it's been before our national parliament that there is a Species at Risk Act in, in Canada, so in the essential it's the, the will of the Canadian people to, to be concerned about endangered species. And um, it's probably better if I put my glasses on and then I can see what the notes say. But we've, uh, you know, beyond our, our, our legislature and our parliament, or maybe, be, maybe because of that, I guess, but but we have me repeatedly made commitments in the international forum, starting in 1995 when we signed on to the first you know, Western culture, the first economically rich country to sign on to the uh, International Convention on Biological Diversity. And, and, and then subsequently, even much more recently, in October 2010, we went to the conference in uh, Nagoya, Japan, and we signed on to the Aichi Biodiversity uh, Targets, one of which is that we will have legislation for uh, protecting endangered species. So we have international commitments, we have national commitments, we have local commitments, and we have a responsibility to our children's children and our children's children's children, an intergenerational responsibility, not to deny future generations the richness of the living ecosystems that we have enjoyed and benefited from in, in our lifetime. So these are some of our responsibilities. But we also know that if, you know, in this, this time we live in where there's um, a lot of short-term self-interest, I think this mic's a bit loud. We're concerned about short-term self-interest. We also know that it is in our short-term self-interest to, to protect the proper functioning of our ecosystems. You know, to quote, uh, you know, Aldo Leopold's famous quote, rem quote reminds us, he says, the, uh, to, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. That's what Leopold said. And that, and that it really is true that, you know, it, but it, it, it speaks to the practicality, the short-term benefit to ourselves to, to protecting uh, endangered species. But in the end, ultimately, it's a moral question. Is it, is it, is it right? You know, given that we, we, is it right that we knowingly and willfully destroy a species when we know we have the choice not to do it? That's a moral question, and that's at the essence. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's why ultimately we know that the, the bird on the island in the uh, Indian Ocean, the uh, Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, was the dodo bird, and we that name uh, persists in our culture. It's even in the. You know, Lewis Carroll even put it in the um, Alice in Wonderland story because it had a, such a profound effect because ultimately deep down 
it's a moral thing that we do. I think that's important to say those words because we're talking about, uh, you know, the Ontario Endangered Species Act. And, uh, uh, of course, I, I, Endangered Species Act has been with me all my adult life. It actually, you know, follows me quite, quite uh, you know, became, a, I guess, a legal audit in 1971 when the first Endangered Species Act was passed. I've always been a, you know, in those days I was a would-be ecologist. <laughs> Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I was very interested. And the, and the first endangered species was, was actually, the, I believe, the second one in the world after the U.S. had put their Endangered Species Act. So it was really a, a profound piece of legislation for Ontario. And it was extremely well-intentioned. There's no question about that. But ultimately, it was a failure. The first Endangered Species Act was a failure. It was too simple in its construction. And, you know, basically it was, there very, it was only six paragraphs long or something. It said, Cabinet can declare something an endangered species, and then you can't harm or destroy its habitat or harm or destroy the endangered species. And if you do, we prosecute you. You know, we hit you, we punish you. And that was about the act. And there was no, first of all, there was no real clear definition of what habitat was all about. That was an obscure term. And there were no exceptions. There were no tools. There was no flexibility. So MNRs, you know, only way out was to prosecute in a case where some endangered species were impacted. Well, our society is more complex than that. It soon became, uh, soon became obvious that there were unresolvable conflicts with, uh, and disputes with landowners relating to the Endangered Species Act. But because in that act, listing a species was essentially a political decision, uh, the solution that came out of it was a political solution. We just didn't list any species. It's interesting that, and because it, it couldn't resolve the conflict, so we don't list any species. But we had this, MNR had this other list of endangered species, but they weren't protected under the legislation. It's interesting that uh, I think, being uh, the age I am, uh, I hope some of you know who Douglas Adams is, um, and you will realize that in, in 2008, when we, the new act uh, took, took effect, there, there, from under the old legislation, there are only 42 species listed in the Endangered Species Act. 42. It's 42 years since we had the Endangered Species Act. Now, for those who read Douglas Adams, do you know what 42 is? Aha, some do. It's the answer to the question of, the, of life, the universe, and everything. So I don't know. I think I just thought, I thought, I thought for introduce that. It has some deep meaning here at some, at some level. Douglas Adams is the same, same age as I am, and unfortunately he's passed away. That's a bad precedent, I suppose. So what happened? What happened to the old act? Well, after so after a number of a uh, number of various uh, people came forward and, and filed with the um, office of the environmental commissioner, my office, requests for review of the endangered species act. I've forgotten how many we had. Every time was there was this wonderful submission of requests for review, and every one was uh, you know was well argued and gave good reasons, and every one was turned down by the Ministry of Natural Resources. So we had. You know, the years went by and no review of the Endangered Species Act. And then one day, just like the Hank Williams song, uh, MNR saw the light. And a new in, in, out of their own spontaneous occurrence, it occurred to them that maybe after they turned down three times, people saying, we need a new Endangered Species Act, maybe we need a new Endangered Species Act. So they did. Hey, I don't criticize them for it, because in 2007, a new act was born. And the new act, the one we have still, is, is a very strong piece of legislation. It, it, it really, you know, intellectually is a very well-structured piece of le legislation. Because what the new act, and let's be clear of this, because you're going to hear lots of discussion about today and the next two days about this, uh, about this act. And let's be clear, basically there's three steps in the, in the process involving an endangered species. First of all, you start with Casero, which is a group of scientists, and they look at the scientific information and consider all well, all that they have and the uncertainties associated with it, and they, they come up with a recommendation to whether it's endangered, threatened, or the species of special concern. That is a scientific independent decision. And then that decision that's the science goes to another group, which could, could include scientists, but also includes some engineers or practical people, or other, uh, other matters of, of, of uh, how society, uh, relating to how society interacts with that species, and they work on a recovery plan. So you know its status, and then the recovery plan is produced, and in the recovery plan you essentially know what you can do about it if, in terms of improving the situation for that species or not, what your limitations are, what's realistic, it's a recovery plan. How could we help this species? 
Then you take those two documents, one that says that the species has this, threat, this endangered status, and, it, and here's the recovery, here's our options on recovery, and you give it to the, the government, but, which is potentially the Ministry of Natural Resources, and you say, their government, and now you have a certain amount of time to, to come up with a government response. And it's at that point, at that government response statement, that the socioeconomic concerns, the conflicts associated with doing something or not doing something are supposed to be incorporated, and the government is supposed to come back with a response statement that says, here is what we're prepared to do or not do. And that's where the, the tough decisions are, are to be made. And I've been critical in my reports because the government response statements that I have seen suck. Okay. <laughs> they don't do that, right? They don't come out and say, here, we're going to do this. Or guess what? As much as we'd like to do it, we're not going to do it for socioeconomic reasons. That's just truth, okay? So that's, but that's the beauty of the, of the thing. And then because, because we know that there are these conflicts inherent in trying to interact with private lands and our economy and these endangered species, the, the act gives the government a whole bunch of tools in which to make the thing practically work. So right, right off the bat, the government can decide not to take any action or what action it takes. Well, the government can apply broad exemptions from any of the prohibitions. Of course, the main prohibitions are, are you can't harm a species or you can't destroy its habitat. But the government can choose how to manage that, how much habitat there is. They can, they can make as less habitat or as more, much habitat as they want. That's within the discretion and legislation. And, and, the, you know, and at the end of the day, when you have to do something to damage the habitat or damage the species, the government can issue permits with conditions on them to allow that to happen. So all these tools are in the toolkit. This is in the existing legislation, and that's why, you know, when we did our, our major review of the legislation back in 2009, it, we gave it, we, which is on your memory stick, for those of you who got one, USB stick coming in the door, uh, you, you know, we gave it an excellent review because we, we still think, and I still think, that this is the best model for species at risk legislation in the Western world. It is a great model. It should be really good. So why are we here? So why is this thing off the rails? And, and you know, why are there private members that bills before the legislature have been to try to, to, to change the legislation? What's wrong? Here, here the commissioner says it's good, it seems to have symmetry, but, but we're nonetheless here in this, with this problem. Well, let me tell you, let me give you six, six little stories, six little scenarios that, these are just the ones that come to me, let alone the number that I imagine came to the Ministry of Natural Resources. But one's a little a quarry operator I happen to know. And this is not a mega cement company quarry operator. This is just a local guy in a small town. And one of the things he has, he has a little 30 or 40 acre quarry, which has been operating. It's not given any problem. They, he wanted to expand that for another 50 acres. This person owns considerable amounts of land in an area of the province that is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good agricultural land. It's up in, up in, the, in Victoria County. Uh, for those of you who know, it's you know, just limestone covered by a little bit of glacial till. It's, it was cleared for, for cattle, uh, you know, and it's been growing up. It's not great cattle land, but it grows up with hawthorn plants. Well, hawthorn, cattle, we're talking loggerhead shrike area. And so when he, when he wanted to start the work, he hired biologists and start the application for a, an expansion of his quarry. And the biologists, uh, uh, you know, saw the company, went and did their bird survey, and they, and they came up with, uh, they heard a loggerhead shrike. Well, not surprising. It's ideal habitat. They didn't find nesting. They just, they heard a loggerhead to put it in their report. Well, as a response to that, the Ministry of Natural Resources said, we well, can't expand your quarry. Well, wait a minute. They heard a loggerhead shrike in loggerhead shrike habitat. I mean, no, you, you we, we, we're stalled. We're not going to, we're not, actually, they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't process this application any further. There was no res resolution. He just lost that. Okay, now as you have to know, this person owns well, I don't know, perhaps thousands of acres, certainly hundreds of acres of this sort of site, and it's, it is right and privilege under the agricultural discretion that he, he has to remove all those hawthorn plants off thousands or hundreds of acres of, of agricultural land, and that's what was done. Okay, so the decision to stall this quarry resulted in the loss of several hundred acres of loggerhead shrike habitat. 
somehow that doesn't sound like the right outcome to me, okay? Example two, I'm not going to belabor these things, but the wood turtle, the big fight up in the Ottawa Valley. There's been, forestry has been going on in the Ottawa Valley for 150 years, and yet all of a sudden, well, there are wood turtles there. Well, yes, there are. And so, for a while, it looked like they're going to stop all, well, that's what the loggers thought, they're going to stop all timber management in the area because there's wood turtles. Well, yes, there have been wood turtles back since, the, probably since the, soon after the last glaciation, and they're still there. So the solution is perhaps, and of course, and that one ended it, that the Ministry of Natural Resources finally later came out with guidelines and things that said basically there's very little problem and that problem's gone away. But initially it started in the anxiety, the fight, the things in the newspaper, the, the political uh, and, uh, angst that was going on. Move down another forest area, move down to, to, to Norfolk County, where the Conservation Authority has been for almost 50 years has been managing some woodlots, hardwood woodlots that occur down the Caledonian Forest. And, and, and the, when the act came in, the, the next year, the, the ecologist, the, the, the professional, uh, professional forester, ecologist, uh, who was a contractor, went out and assessed the woodlot that had been cut and managed uh, every decade for a number of years and, uh, and said, well, we're going to take out these trees. And they submitted the plan. Uh, to Ministry of Natural Resources because there were the presence of endangered species being flowering dogwood. Well, and our said, well, you can't cut the woodlot. We don't know how to deal with this. We can't cut the woodlot. There's flowering dogwood. He says, of course there's flowering dogwood. We've been managing this forest for 40 years to keep the flowering dogwood, and now we can't cut the forest? And the outcome of that is that the conservation already lost $60,000 of income that it uses for what? acquiring lands to protect them for endangered species. Another great outcome, right? And, and then, oh, then there's, the, there's the call I got one day from a, let's just say a senior government official, wanting to know, Gord, you know, what would you think if we removed the 17.2 17 permits on the Endangered Species Act from the listing on the Environmental Bill of Rights Registry? That's the, that's the overall benefit. Permits, you know, permits that allow you, and, and it was about, well, what's this about? Well, it's about butternut trees. You know, like the butternut trees are diseased right now, and some of them are healthy, and then if you have a developer that has some land and have four or five butternut trees, the ones, the ones that are diseased, they, they, they remove, and then they, and if there's some healthy ones, they, trans, you know, they won't develop the land, they move them under one of these overall benefit permits, get a permit, they move the trees, and then they plant five, five or six or whatever, whatever number uh, of young ones they get from the nursery onto another land. That's an overall benefit move. How, how hard is it to approve that? Well, the reason that they were looking at EBR, but they're saying, well, it's, it's taken nine months to get approvals on these things. How can it take nine months to approve the moving of butternut trees from, from one spot to another? I mean, it's, it's a good thing, right? So and then there's Ducks Unlimited. Ducks Unlimited, who builds what do they do? They build these little dams about this high and produce wetlands where there are no wetlands, and wetlands those get occupied by those what? Those nasty endangered species. You know, so MNR has a wetland. MNR DU has a wetland that they've created, that the Blanding's turtle has moved into. So they've created new habitat, and they have an obligation to maintain the dams. And they go to try to make, get a permit to maintain the dams, and they can't because the Blanding turtle might habitat might get disrupted. Well, wait a minute. If we don't maintain the dam, I'll tell you the blanding turtle habitat's going to get disrupted when the whole damn wetland drains, right? This is absurd. So it goes on to, to Bobolink. And some of you know Bobolink, right? Bobolink, climate change is being made in the, the peak protein content of the hay to, to, to the hay crop has to be cut three weeks earlier because of the warming spring. Bobolinks haven't figured that out. And they're nesting on their, on their usual photo length uh, uh, stimulus. And so now the babies are still in the nest when the, when the hay harvester and the mowers come, come in by. And, and we have a problem relating. Now, it's not the bobolink's problem. And it's not even the farmer's problem. The farmers have been cutting hay for hundreds of years. It is a result of circumstances, climate change things. And so we, we have a, a, an issue. And bobolinks get killed down in South America. But more about that later. 
But the, the key thing in all these examples, that I, these, these are ones that are brought to my attention, and, and implicit in all these situations, I see no flaw in the legislation. There is no flaw in the legislation. You can fix all these things and, and within the powers existing in the legislation. So why, why are, we, are we attacking the legislation when this is not a matter of, of, of legislative change, it's a matter of implementation and just getting on with the job? The MNR report tells me that they've, uh, they hired Deloitte to do a study and they found that on average, MNR invests 500 hours over the course of four years to develop a permit under the ESA costing roughly $24,000. And of course, there are hundreds if not thousands of permits to issue. How can that be? I used to run Ministry of Environment offices. I've issued and signed permits and authorized things for years. I wish I had the resources to spend four years and $24,000 to approve something. I mean, that's absurd. So, I mean, I think that number is just one of those fuzzy, what's the correct term, um, you know, numbers that they pull out of the air and the economists and accountants are, are, are want to do. But I think it illustrates the point. They're saying it's too expensive. It's not too expensive. Why does it take like nine months to issue a butternut permit? Why does it take $24,000? I mean, come on. Come on. Just because before we had this act, they could do whatever they wanted, essentially, on those, on, certainly on butternut. It wasn't a listed species on the old act. So, so they could... They could do whatever they wanted without anything. So we go from that, where, where we got an act where we can actually get some overall benefit, and what do we do? We say, no, we're going to screw your whole development. We're going to stop, shut down the world. We're going to stop everything, because now we have this act. That's our implementation plan. I don't think that's very practical. So I'm told we must be concerned about balance in these matters. And I say it is not about balance. It's about getting the best information on the on the reality of the situation and having a proper public discussion, a public discussion, and making some tough decisions. That's what it's about. And it's not about deceiving the public about the effects of these decisions or, or, or deflecting public attention or in any way hiding the consequences. It's to stand up, it's to stand up and say, no, it's a, in the case of the bobolink, we're going to cut hay in Ontario because we're not shutting down agriculture. So we'll have to come up with something else. And it's not about, as they do sometimes do, attacking the scientists who are giving us their best advice. It, you know, so one of the solutions here is to, well, I've heard, is the scientists who are on Casero are being attacked as in terms of decision. No, this is scientific decision. This isn't a, a plebiscite. This isn't a public opinion poll. It's science. And these guys are giving them, you know, the best scientific advice for no money, with no resources, out of their deep personal commitment for preserving biodiversity. That's why Casero scientists are doing that. So let's just get off their back. Because at the end of the day, if we don't like it, if we can't do anything about it, we can ignore it, right? We can say, well, we're not doing anything. That's the honest thing, but not to dump on the scientists. And lastly, in this list, I think, and it's not about the landowners. I know the landowners are upset. I believe me, my phone rings, and I know the landowners. But you know, here's what I say. Here's what we should say to a landowner that has an endangered species on his or her property. Here's, you go to them and the first thing you say is, thank you. I was out there in the box store parking lot yesterday and I didn't see any endangered species in the 15 acres of asphalt, right? If you've got endangered species on your property, you must be doing something right. So the second thing you say to the landowner is, how can we help you make this continue to happen? What, how can we work together? What can we do? What incentives can we give you? How can we make this better for the endangered species? But you don't dump on the landowner and you don't take away their private land rights. And if it's really, really important that you save that, that property the way it is, you bloody well start to think about paying them for it. And because it's their land and they've kept the land dangerous species alive this long. So if society thinks it's that important, then you know there's organizations that, that, that will, will work to do that. So let's go quickly back through my examples. You know, the wood turtle was a problem solved if they had the right guidelines out in, in the first place. There wouldn't have been a contrary. The quarry strikes the situation. My God, that guy who, who was put in that situation and lost his approval, he had hundreds of acres of, of ideal loggerhead strike habitat. And if they'd gone to him and said, could you like maybe put a 
conservation easement to protect 100 or 200 acres of loggerhead strike ideal habitat? He'd, he would have said yes, at no cost. Sure, because he's running cattle on it anyway, right? Lost opportunity. The, the forest management, the flowering dogwoods example, why not go to them and say, oh yeah, you can cut your forest, but we'd really like to know how you are managing a forest to preserve the endangered species of flowering dogwood. Could you maybe give us a report so we could give that to other landowners and maybe we can enhance the flowering dogwood habitat across the, you know, the Carolinian forest? The, the butternut, I'm not even gonna go there. It's, that's too frustrating to even talk about. <laughs> and with far as Ducks and Limited and, and their blending, my God, this is, a, this is an organization that does nothing but create endangered species habitat, if you like. That's what they do. Get off their backs, right? There's one that you can back away. I mean, I, I put it in my notes here. I, I said they're perhaps the, the greatest creator and protector of endangered species habitat in Ontario, but then I see the NCC over here, so I have to acknowledge them too. <laughs> and the, uh, up to now, I gave more money to your organization, but I bought a shotgun at the Ducks and Limited Dinner, so you're now behind the eight ball on that. But the last example is the bobolink, and, let, and, and the bobolink is, is, is I, I come back to it because it's probably the best example of a tough decision that we might have to make. It's not made yet. There's a, we're still in the middle of a three-year moratorium on this, but we're, we may have to make it make that it's not in the interest of the species because practically there aren't a lot of solutions here. I don't think see them coming. Maybe somebody will correct me and come up with something brilliant. But just for purposes of the discussion, let's assume we have to make the tough decision for bobolinks, and that is we're going to cut the hay, right? So. There's nothing wrong with making that honest and tough decision if you make it openly and tell people that's the reality. But if, once you do that, once you say, okay, here's a, you know, go to, if MNR says that, look, your government's not gonna do anything about this, it opens the door for other parties with other solutions to intervene. You know, the aforementioned Nature Conservancy then, then, then might have the justification when I get my monthly envelope, whatever it is, and say, to say, look, we gotta save some, we gotta pay some farmers to manage some meadowlands for bobolinks, right? And then people like me flip a few bucks to them. Well, there's this, the Atlas program in agriculture that uh, modified, and in fact, they do this already. I know in at least one case where a farmer is, grows tall grass prairie and, and is paid not to cut it, or actually it's grazed it, not, not to graze it until after the birds are all fledged. And, um, but, you know, there's Ontario Nature and all their federated clubs, and so it goes on. There are all these other factors and players in society that can step up. If they know the government can handle Endangered species A problem uh, with, by some practical means, fine. And if they know there is no practical means to handle, like the bobolink example, then these agencies, these other ent entities can come into play. Why not release the innovation, the ingenuity? So we just have to do a better job at implementation. That's, that's the, the, the crux of this whole, my, my, whole, my whole presentation here. It's not the legislation, it's just how we implement it. So just to get on with putting the resources in that instead of fighting about changing the Endangered Species Act. You know, when I was a kid, the expression you heard, I don't hear it anymore, but it was as dumb as a dodo. Remember our dodo? Dodos were plagued as being dumb things because they, when the first uh, seafarers came onto the island, um, and they came and, they, and the dodos who had no fear of humans, they could walk up to them and they were like a big turkey and they could just kill them and eat them, right? So dumb as a dodo is an expression. I don't hear it anymore. But I, you know, I've been rethinking on that. I said, you know, maybe the dodo just stood for a different kind of relationship between humans and nature. You know, by our actions, we drove the dodo to extinction. We disrupted the island ecosystem totally. Our food source was gone as much of the whole island ecosystem fell apart for other disruptions. And, and that practically affected the utilization of sailors in, in, the, in the ocean for, for us a century or more. And clearly our society, our Western society, felt regret at that. So you wonder, if we don't learn the lesson of the dodo, who's the dumb one now? Thank you.